This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Okay, so you're in the subway, or better yet, you're in an airplane, and you have your iPod, and you're going to listen to that new St. Vincent record that just came out. So you put on your headphones, and because of that indiscriminate roar produced when, you know, a tube of metal hurtles through the sky at 800 miles an hour, you have to really crank up your tunes in order to enjoy the dulcet tones of Annie Clark and her guitar. And even then, really it's just tunes... And engine. Unless, instead of standard issue iPod earbuds, you happen to be armed with something to restrain the plane did. Something to ward off all of that racket. What if you had noise-canceling headphones? And just like that, the roar of the jet engines, the deafening voice of the machinery hurtling you through the stratosphere is reduced to a dull, and distant whisper, allowing you now to fully appreciate the roar of regret. So the cream of the noise-canceling crop achieve this sonic voodoo in a two-step process. The first step is kind of the obvious one. You make it as hard as possible to hear any sound that's produced outside of the headphones. You think of, like, those huge, boxy, plastic, orange or yellow earmuff things that you can buy at the hardware store with the padded rubber gasket around the edge, and when you put them on, they completely cover your ears. Your ears just become encased in these things. You would wear them while blowing leaves, or, you know, maybe when your neighbor listens to that same Simply Red song really loud, on loop, all night long... They're sometimes called shooting earmuffs, not because you want to shoot your neighbor, but because they're used on shooting ranges as hearing protection. They clamp onto your head like a vice. They put a tight seal around your ears. They're thick. They're made of this material, usually uh, like a kind of foam, that sound waves have a hard time getting through. They provide good isolation. They isolate you from the sound world outside. That's important. We're going to talk more about isolation in a little bit. Now, of course, construction-grade hearing protection isn't the most attractive or comfortable thing in the world. Plus, it, it doesn't really make the world silent, just less dangerous to listen to. So only a shade of this head-gripping, brute force noise reduction is used in noise-canceling headphones. The rest of the work that noise-canceling headphones do is done by electronics. The expensive models of these headphones, the Cadillacs of Quiet, they're called active noise-canceling headphones. Active because they do, in some sense, take action. They listen. Or maybe it's more accurate to say that they measure. I don't know. I'd always considered the word listen to indicate some kind of Uh, like neurobiological or cognitive process. People and animals listen. Machines measure. Either way, 
semantics aside, active noise cancelling headphones, they measure the sound occurring around them and they play it back. In addition to St. Vincent or whatever you happen to be listening to, they play back the sonic inverse of the sound they've measured, thus cancelling out whatever might disturb your ideally pristine sonic escapades. So while you're listening to FKA Twigs, your noise-canceling headphones are listening to the sound of the mall food court, recording it, flipping it, and canceling it out. While you're listening to Arvo Pert, your noise-canceling headphones are listening to the roar of traffic going by on the BQE, flipping it, and canceling it out. But okay, a fair question you might be asking is, how does flipping translate into cancelling? It's a bit of a digression, so we'll put on some digression music. But let's go down this road for a second. So sound is transmitted through air as waves. It produces what are called compressions and rarefactions in air, spots of increased and then decreased density. It's not just compressions or just rare factions that produce sound. It's the very specific and particular arrangement of both that comprise anything you hear as it travels through air. Even the very small bit of air between your headphones and inner ear. So what happens, then, when you produce a compression at exactly the same time as a rare faction? A simultaneous increase in density and decrease in density. It's kind of like turning down the volume on your stereo while you turn up the volume on an iPod that you have plugged into it. Or it's kind of like adding five and negative five. They cancel each other out. This is what noise-canceling headphones do. They produce a compression when the outside world is producing a rarefaction and vice versa. So everything cancels out. You're left with nothing, or almost nothing. The process of active noise cancellation is really complicated and it has to happen in real time, which can be tough depending upon what has to be canceled, and so some noise is left uncanceled. And even the best noise canceling gear leaves behind these little artifacts, a little hiss or a weird warble. Which is to say, noise-canceling headphones produce some of their own noise. So how's that for technological irony? But okay, digression over. The other thing that these headphones produce, besides a little noise, is space. More so, I think, than your run-of-the-mill, over-the-counter garden variety headphones, noise-canceling headphones manufacture this personal sonic space. Their aim is to leave their wearer unassaulted by the world and the noise it produces. Noise-canceling headphones, they create this border around the listener's specifically chosen sounds. And they're designed to take actions which maintain that border. Some noise-canceling headphones don't even have an option to turn off noise cancelling to re-invite the outside world into your listening experience. These models totally collapse the process of listening and disregarding. In order for you to listen, you also have to ignore, you have no choice. To listen is to technologically produce some personal space. This is the isolation we were talking about earlier. But where those crazy earmuffs, those shooting muffs, are indiscriminate, right? Their ideal is to isolate you from sound experience. Noise-canceling phones kind of work to isolate you within a sound experience. Specifically within the sound experience that you have chosen. A sound experience of your own choosing. These are two really different ideas of what isolation is and like how it can work. It's almost like the listening version of offense versus defense. It's a difference between, uh, I don't know, like preservation and new construction. 
Noise canceling headphones don't really just block noise. They construct a situation where sonic phenomena deemed noise are reduced. It's a little more complicated than just stopping sonic information dead in its tracks. Because, I mean, after all, it's, it's not stopped, right? It just sounds like it's been stopped. The outside world noise is allowed into your private headphone zone. It's just changed once it's crossed the border. It's flipped so it can be used to do the canceling. The sound of the outside world, all of it, or I guess whatever is picked up by the tiny microphones built into those headphones, is put to work. It's instrumentalized in the process that creates that sonic barrier. It's crucial to a process which ultimately results in the canceling of itself. I find this whole noise-canceling process strangely political. Not like the president and Congress people political, but the general maintenance and distribution of power and authority political. Not a group of people making government work, but a constant process underlying influence and establishment. And I know, I know they're just headphones you're thinking, or you've just said out loud in your car, or better yet, on the train. And now everyone around you is wondering why you're suddenly so defensive about your personal listening device. Unfortunately, noise-canceling headphones, if you do happen to be wearing them right now, don't cancel anything for other people. Only the wearer. Anyway, I bring up politics because there's this idea that technology is just a tool. I've heard uber-famous philosopher Noam Chomsky talk about this, that technology is a tool and that there's nothing inherently good or bad about tools. Rather, there are good and bad ways for people to use them. And I think... No offense to Mr. Chomsky, about whom it would be a gross understatement to say is much, much smarter than me. I think the idea that all technology is always neutral until it's in the hands of a person who decides how to use it is just complete hooey. Whether we realize it or not, we bake our ideas about how the world does and should work into the things we make, including and especially technology. And when we then use that technology, it can very subtly change or influence or reinforce or even just give context to the way we act in or think about the world. Now, I'm not saying that anyone is putting together some grand conspiracy in which noise-canceling headphones are implicated. Don't get your tinfoil hats out just yet. I'm only saying that it's possible consumer technology is not the neutral and wholly practical set of tools we might like to think it is. The design and use of technology, of all things, really, is subject to habit, whim, institutional idiosyncrasies, ideology, even plain, old, boring conveniences. And so, in the extreme cases, we get stuff like film stock that won't properly expose photos of people with black skin. This is why early dev kit versions of the Oculus Rift, the virtual reality headset, allegedly made women more dizzy than men. Technology, then, is not neutral, not even a little. The construction of technology, of most things, reflects the situation in which it was constructed. And so, when we ask questions about that situation two things can happen. We might learn more about that technology, or we might learn more about ourselves. Or both, if we're lucky. The idea is not to find out what's wrong with everything, but rather to ask about why things are the way they are. Which we're going to do right now, because we've spent plenty of time at this point in the abstract theory trench. Time to climb out.
With noise-canceling headphones, there's some kind of really weird becoming. A transformation that occurs when noise from the outside world is brought into the interior space, flipped, and used to produce quiet. Noise is distracting or unwanted. It obscures sound, the meaningful, desirable, useful portion of what we hear. So then, as the noise of the outside world is measured and then used in the process of noise cancellation, as it moves from outside to inside, it transforms from noise into sound, from unwanted distraction to necessary element. This is the instrumentalization we were talking about earlier. When noise is outside our headphone zone, we want to get rid of it to make it disappear. Once the headphones doctor it up a little bit, bam, useful. It's been changed, rehabilitated, made worthwhile by our hearing gadget. I see this as some level of political, some expression of power. It might be a minor one, but I think it's one nonetheless. You're wearing a device that measures the sound something is producing and using that sound to minimize your own experience of it. When that sound is a jet engine, okay, you show that jet engine who's boss, but when that sound is people, I have some faces to make. I'm making them right now. You just, you can't see them. I'll post them on Instagram, reasonably SND. Generally, noise-canceling headphones would be pretty bad at canceling out the voice of one person speaking, or even a small group, simply because of the complexity of the sound, but what if it's a crowd of people, more of, like, the sound of a general mass of people, a large gathering? Does the idea of using the sound of voices to silence those same voices feel a little, I don't know, weird? It does to me. Even if it's just from your perspective, from one single point of view, it feels like an application of power. In that situation, you would be powerful because you could instrumentalize those voices to diminish what authority as a sound-producing body they might possess. It's a use of something's own force against itself. Establishing and maintaining silence is a very powerful thing, and it's exactly what noise-canceling headphones attempt to do. They attempt to establish and maintain silence. There's a pretty commonly held idea that the baseline for a high-quality listening experience is the complete lack of sonic information. When you start from silence, everything that's part of your listening experience is there on purpose. There's nothing extra. No noise. Especially in the high-end audio world, silence is equated with a kind of purity. It's the perfect starting point because it's blank and pristine. In silence, the listener is isolated. They have control. Silence is relaxing and clear. Silence is also a lie, actually. This was something the American composer John Cage is famous for having advocated. The way the story goes is that he visits Harvard and gets to go into their anechoic chamber. This is a room which, when sealed, is perfectly sonically isolated from the outside world. No sound in, no sound out. It's like a massive, faultless version of those earmuffs. And so, standing inside this room, what does John Cage hear? Not nothing. He hears the sound of his blood pumping a low kind of rumble, and the sound of his synapses firing, a kind of high, fizzling sound. And so here he is, standing in this quote-unquote silent room, and he's realized that as long as you're inside a human body, there can never be silence. This is a bit of a mind f because not only listening to, but also writing music for about the last, oh, I don't know, 2,000 plus years, has been built on the idea of silence as the necessary starting condition. 
The composer starts with a blank page and fills it with notes. The concert hall begins in silence, and when the conductor raises his baton, the musicians fill it with sound. Except... Nope. There is always, 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 always something beyond what the composer has written or is being played in the concert hall. Maybe it's the blood and brain sounds of everyone in the room, but also maybe it's an ambulance driving by outside, or the tick-tock of the percussionist's watch, the clanging of radiators, or that St. Vincent song the guy in the third row, four seats from the left of the aisle, has stuck in his head. All these things are part of the composition. You can ask the world to be silent, but it won't listen. It can't hear you. It's too noisy. And so Cage and many other composers started using traditionally non-musical sounds in their compositions. Sounds found out in the world, made not by instruments, but by anything, everything. They were given permission, essentially. Those noises would be included in their pieces somehow, whether they wanted them or not. So what the hell? You know what they say, if you can't beat them, join them. Cage's most famous piece, 433, is a silent piano piece, the sound of which is actually whatever happens to be occurring in the performance venue at the time. Coughing, air conditioning, synapses, blood, but not silence, because silence doesn't exist. Noise is everywhere, all the time, even in noise-canceling headphones. Or maybe especially, what with their weird sonic artifacts. The ultimate irony, I guess, would be to listen to a recording of 433 on noise-canceling headphones. Better yet, while attending a performance of 433. You would be using the sound of the purposeful emphasis on the meaningful content of noise to cancel out that meaningful content. Also, you can listen to a recording of noise that you have deemed more meaningful. So I realize this is a totally absurd example. I can't imagine anyone has ever done this. Though, if someone out there does give it a shot, please let me know how it goes. Either way, as a sound-related thought experiment, I think it does illustrate what kind of power you are asserting when you treat the sound of your environment as noise by putting on noise-canceling headphones. With the impossible nature of a listening foundation that starts at silence, Noise-canceling headphones enact a kind of value judgment about the worth of one kind of noise over another. Noise-canceling headphones assume what is happening inside them is fundamentally different from what's happening outside them. And I think it's worth asking if that's true. When one is able to effectively shut out a part of the world, one is saying that part of the world is unimportant, meaningless. And furthermore, that part is a type of unimportant which just allows me to use it. It is so unimportant that it is available. I can use it for my own convenience. I'm not saying this is always bad, or that we shouldn't. Or that it's always good and we should. Only that attempts to manufacture silence are not, strictly speaking, inherently neutral. Futile, sure. Neutral? Maybe not so much. My name is Mike Rugnetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Instagram at ReasonablySND. You can find me on Twitter at Mike Rugnetta. Draw me a line. Say hey. Make some noise.